very much for the invitation. Um, uh, this talk is based on the following three papers, uh, which are now available on the archive, joint work with Gay Letter and Siddhartha. And I will mostly talk about the first paper. I'll briefly say a few things about the last two papers, but like already the first paper takes a lot of my time. Um, so let me motivate my talk by talking about the first fundamental theorem of invariant theory. So let G be just GLNC and V be the standard representation of GLN. So G acts naturally on V and of course on the dual of V. And now let's consider EKL to be V direct from K plus V star direct from L. Sorry if I'm saying very basic things. I see like I was, I don't know how, I wasn't sure about the audience. I thought maybe they're graduate students or non-experts. And to be honest, these are recycled slides from a talk I gave last week uh, in Montreal. So. EKL is just direction of K copies of the standard representations and L copies of the dual of the standard representation. Then G acts on this space EKL, therefore it acts on the space of polynomials on EKL by the usual left translation. And then a classical problem in invariant theory is to give concrete generators and relations for the algebra of D invariant in this uh, polynomial space as a G module. And the answer to this is known. This is a classical result. Apparently, goes back to the work of Pure, even, and it's written with a rigorous proof in the uh, classical books, the book of Hermann Weyl. So here, one knows that uh, for each of the k indices, one can pair the k yeah, from the, 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 the components with any of the components here. So for each i between one and k and j between one and l, you can pair the i-th component here with the j-th component here. It's like a duality of um, this is an ordinary pairing on the dual of the vector space and itself. And then uh, by this pairing, you get a quadratic polynomial defined as such. This pi i j is a quadratic polynomial in on uh, this EKL. And well, uh, then one knows that these polynomials generate the algebra of invariance. And of course, there's the, another statement about the relations between these. So this statement is the first fundamental theorem. The phi ij is generating the invariance, and then the second fundamental theorem is about the relations between. Them. So another uh, related space is the space of n by n m by n uh, matrices and polynomials on the space of m by n matrices. Let's call that p. So p is just the polynomials on the m by n matrix space. And now GLM cross GLN acts on this by left and right multiplication in the usual way. And one can pass to the Lie algebra and look at this as a module for the Lie algebra GLM plus GLN. And the important observation is that the action of GLM and GLN, at least the generators of GLM and GLN on this space P, are given by order one differential operators, which are typically known as polarization operators. So each EIG from GLM acts by this kind of differential operator, and each EIG from GLN acts by this kind of differential operator. Uh, so this means that, in fact, the action of GLM and GLN, or if you like, it's the universal enveloping algebra of GLM and GLN when it acts on P, it's given by polynomial coefficient differential operators. Here, by polynomial coefficient differential operators, I mean this algebra PD, whose generators are the xij for i and j, for i between 1 and m and j between 1 and n, and the dij, the partial of ij's, or again, same range of i's and j's, which satisfy the usual Leibniz relation, which describes the Weyl algebra. Now, note that P is also a PD module. And as I said, the action of the Lie algebra can always be passed to the action of the universal enveloping algebra. And this means that, I mean, the, the, the fact that the uh, operators EIJ on the previous slide are given by polarization operators on P, this means that you have this map from this tensor product of the enveloping algebra of GLN and GLN into this algebra PD defined up here such that this triangle commutes. So here, the first row is the action of this uh, enveloping algebra on P that came from the GLM cross GLN action. And then here you have this embedding, and this map is just the usual action of differential operators on polynomials. So we have this kind of triangle, commutative diagram. And the important observation of Roger Howe in uh, the Schur lectures, the so-called Schur lectures, perspectives in variant theory, was that the images of the enveloping algebras of GLM and GLN inside PD are mutual centralized. So each of them is the centralizer of the other one inside PD. And the second observation was that, in fact, from this mutual centralizer, you get an easy proof of the first fundamental theorem for GLN. So just a trivial remark that, uh, which might not sound trivial at first when you think about it, but <laughs> it is really trivial. The two algebras 
the images of the enveloping algebras GLM and GLN are not mutual centralizers in the full endomorphism algebra. In fact, the centralizer of one is larger than the image of the other, if you think about it inside the full endomorphism algebra, because P is interdimensional, the full endomorphism algebra is really large. So what I'm trying to say is that this mutual centralizer statement is really a property of the while algebra, if you understood from that point of view. And anyway, there should be something non-trivial there because one can get a quick proof of uh, the first fundamental theorem anyway, which as far as I know, it wasn't trivial to Hermann Weyl. Um, now, a related problem to this picture is the Capelli eigenvalue problem, understanding eigenvalues of Capelli operators, of which Siddhartha is an expert. So I'll briefly review that too. Connect, uh, connected to what I'm going to say. So again, let PD be this the space of M polynomials on M by N matrices. As a GLN module, even GLM cross GLN module, it's a tensor product of P and D, where P is the polynomial space and D is the algebra of constant coefficient differential operators. But now note that uh, uh, D is really in some sense dual to P, so we can think about P tensor D as polynomials on M copies of the standard representation plus M copies of the dual of the standard representation as a GLN module. So we have to forget about the GLM action to think about it this way. So you see that this is space that showed up in the first fundamental theorem is just as a representation for GLN, it's just PD. And now, well, P is it's well known from classical invariant theory that P has this multiplicity free decomposition as GLM cross GLN module with the submodules, irreducible modules that are indexed by partitions of length at most minimum of M and N. Each of these modules is a tensor product of a GLM module parameterized by the partition and the GLN module parameterized by the partition. And uh, from this multiplicity free decomposition of P, one knows that it follows that the algebra of GLM cross GLN invariants inside PD has a distinguished basis indexed by same class of partitions. Again, partitions with length at most minimum of M and N. And now one can ask, what is the eigenvalue of this operator on this component F mu, uh, and the components in the decomposition of P? These operators should leave those components invariant because the decomposition is multiplicity free and these operators are invariant. So they're really intertwining operators in this picture. And they act by scalars by Schur's lemma. So now the question is, what's this scalar? And this is what I'm showing you is a very, very special case of Siddhartha's results. I mean, Siddhartha probably wants me to explain this in a more broad, like a general context, but uh, just for the sake of today's talk, uh, uh, the eigenvalue is just what's called a factorial Schur polynomial, which is given by a formula similar to the determinant formula for Schur polynomials, with the exception that the powers are replaced by falling factorial. And it turns out that this uh, for a, a Coppelli eigenvalue problem for the diagonal case, which is what I explained here, is closely related to the first fundamental theorem, and we can prove fundamental theorem using techniques from here as well. So now the question that arises, and it was part of a project that we were working uh, um, with uh, Gail and Siddhartha on, is can you extend in uh, this whole thing, uh, all of this to the quantum groups, the world of quantum groups? So let me briefly say what I mean by the quantum group. What is my, like my, my conventions? So I take the base fields to be the field of rational functions in a in an indeterminate Q. And now the quantized enveloping algebra of GLN is this deformation of the, the, of the universal enveloping algebra defined as follows. I take Q to be the free abelian group generated by N symbols epsilon one to epsilon N. These are basically the weights, the characters of the torus of GLN. I'm just setting some basic notation. And then I consider this usual pairing uh, where for two elements in Q like lambda and mu express as a linear combination of the epsilon i's, the pairing is just the usual linear product. And now the set of simple roots of type AN that I pick is just the standard system. So this is like alpha i's, which is epsilon i minus epsilon i plus one, and this is the sort of the full root system and so on. And now with all these conventions, the algebra UQGLN, the quantized enveloping algebra of GLN is the K algebra, K being this field, generated by these symbols, EI's and FI's for i between one and n minus one, and the K lambdas for lambda coming from this uh, weight lattice Q, modulo the relations that are shown here, and everybody knows what these are, and uh, I don't want to uh, talk much about that. So, I mean, the usual Q versions of the relations for the GLN, the Lyapunov GLN plus the sort of quantum relations. 
And one also knows that this algebra UQGLN is a half algebra. Here is the co-product, and here's the antipode and the uh, co-unit that makes the half algebra. This is all well known. So now, in order to study, or rather try to develop some first fundamental theorem for the setting, of course, one first needs a polynomial algebra in the Q sense. So what is the quantized coordinate ring of the space of M-bind matrices? It seems that there's more or less a, a consensus in the literature or among quantum group theorists about what it is it's supposed to be. And that comes from what is called the FRT construction, Fadev, Reshetik, and Taftajan. So in this construction, you take uh, a, 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 like what's called an R matrix, which is really just an arbitrary endomorphism in like a, a K linear map in the uh, endomorphism space of uh, K and tensor KN, which is something in like K linear on K and tensor KN. And then you define this algebra generated by N squared symbols, Tij, I and J ranging between one and N, modulo the relations described by this, where R is the transformation chosen here, and the T, the T means the matrix of the Tij's, and T1 means T tensor I, T2 means I tensor T. Note that these variables Tij do not commute, and in fact, uh, if you write them explicitly, you see relations that I show you next. They're not that bad. So in the uh, this, in the in the case that we take R to be the so-called R matrix of the standard representation of the quantum group, which is a, like a transformation according like given by by these coefficients R i j k l, what you get as a bi-algebra is this algebra, which is known usually as the quantized coordinate ring of the space, the n by n matrix of space. So it's generated by the Tij's. So this is for n by n case. Maybe I should be more precise. And on the next slide, next slide, I'll show you what the n by n is. So when m and n are equal, this algebra is generated by Tij for ij between one and n. There are these q comm commutation relations, and there are these relations which tell you what happens to two by two submatrix of this matrix T containing Tij's. How do they commute with each other? So some relations which are not that bad. I mean, in, as I was learning about quantum groups, I learned that you have to be open to doing computations with generators and relations, and these are the nicer ones. Things can be much more friendly. So this is the algebra of n by n, like the coordinate matrix thing of the n by n matrices. And just uh, note that, in fact, uh, uh, this algebra is a subalgebra of the dual half algebra of UQGLN, the finite dual defined in the usual way. And it inherits the bialgebra structure from this dual half algebra. And one can write a simple formula for the generators for the bialgebra structure, Tij, the coproduct maps Tij to the sum Tij tends for Tkj ranging over K. And now UQGLN acts by left and right translation on itself, therefore on its dual. And this PNN remains invariant under this action. And we get left and right translation actions of UQGLN on this algebra P and YN, which are given by such formulas. I mean, the formulas can be described in terms of an involution of the, uh, uh, the half algebra UQGLN shown here. And so these are again, not that bad. And one can even write them explicitly. So the left translations, um, uh, the right translations act on the TIJs on the second index. So the EKs increase the second index, the FKs decrease the uh, second index, and the Ks act by some scalar. So these are just few versions of the usual action of the uh, uh, Lie algebra GLN on its standard representation and so on. So you see that everything is just like a Q deformed, uh, but it's like uh, all believable and you know, all tangible. So now, what about n by n matrices? All you do is you just take a sub matrix of this n, uh, n by n matrices, uh, either like the top m rows or the left uh, m columns, depending on whether m and n, uh, which one is bigger. So you take a sub matrix of this n by n matrices, and the Tij's in that sub matrix of the Tij's generate a sub algebra by, by the similar relations. The relations are just uh, not affected because of the, the way they are written out. And that uh, algebra is called the quantized coordinate ring of uh, the matrix space M uh, mass M by N. And that algebra also uh, inherits an action of UQGLM and UQGLN from uh, the previous action of UQGLN and U, uh, UQGLN on the PN by N by left and right translation. And in fact, one can see that this action, uh, uh, these, these actions make it a module algebra. So in the previous slide, maybe I should have said that I give the relations for the generators only. But because the structure is a module algebra, 
the relations on generators describes all the like the, the action comes right entirely to me uniquely. Okay, so we have this algebra P M by N. We can do the same thing with a slightly different R matrix. Basically, kind of the R matrix of the dual of the standard representation to produce an algebra of constant coefficient differential operators, but in the Q world. So let D N N be D N by N be this sort of FRT algebra corresponding to this other R matrix. The R matrix of the dual of the standard representation. And in fact, one can see that as a bi algebra, the n by n, this d n by n is isomorphic to the op top of p n by n. Op top means you take the opposite product and the co opposite co product, and then you get the isomorphic bi algebra. And then by restricting to a sub matrix m by n of the n by n matrix of the variables, the generators you can produce this algebra of constant coefficient operators on the M by N matrix space. And we denote the generators of this D M by N by the DIJ for I ranging between one and M and J ranging between one and N. And again, this algebra inherits some UQGLM tensor UQGLN action and it's a module algebra for that action. And you can write formulas analogous to what you saw on the previous slide for this action on the generators and everything looks nice. Okay, so now we have this algebra, these algebras of uh, polynomials, Q polynomials on M by N matrices and Q constant coefficient differential operators on M by N matrices. If you want to produce a vial algebra, which is again another ingredient in uh, what we saw in the first fundamental theorem, if you want to produce another uh, sort of a Q vial algebra, we basically maybe have to consider the sensor product and define some mixed relations which describe a product here. So there are various constructions of Weyl algebras uh, in the literature. And as far as I know, maybe there is no disagreement about what the action should be, or rather what the relation should be on the P side only and on the D side only. It's always the question of how like you pick some mixed relations. And we have a proposal for the mixed relations, which, I, which uh, actually work which, with, with respect to what we want to do. So we can prove from first fundamental theorem and so on. Okay, so how do we uh, get the product uh, uh, of the sensor, uh, like a new product on the sensor product, or rather how do we find the, the suitable relation? It turns out that this product uh, comes from the braiding of the category of modules for the quantum group UQGLS. So this takes us to the world of the universal R matrices. I'll briefly review what I mean by that, just maybe to set the record straight. I guess people know these things as well. So let CN be the category of finite dimensional modules for UQGLN under some mild restrictions. So I want the modules to be weight modules, and I want the uh, weight modules, in fact, to be what, they, what people call type 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, which means that the eigenvalues are all powers of Q. There is no roots of unity showing up. But if you don't want to uh, be, uh, I mean, if you don't want to be worried about it, just take a nice category of finite dimensional modules. That would suffice for the purpose of today. Then it turns out that this category CN is a braided monoidal category. So it's monoidal because uh, UQGLN is a co-algebra, you can tensor modules, and uh, uh, it is braided in some non-trivial way. So there is an isomorphism of UQGLN modules between V tensor W and W tensor V, but this isomorphism is not just flipping the coordinates. It's not just a map V tensor W to the, mapping to W tensor V. One has to first do something to this V tensor uh, W, you know, apply certain map here and then flip the coordinate. And this map R, as far as I know, it was first discovered by Drinfeld. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and it's given by some power series like this, it's some kind of formal expression. It has this Q exponential in it and it involves the root vectors inside the quantum group. And the root vector means for any root, you have some long commutator. Q commutator that uh, plays the role of a root vector somehow, just like the Lie algebras. And then there's this other power series here with some usual conventions that e to the h denotes Q and the Q exponential is just this power series. So it's some sort of infinite formal sum. That, but the point is that it acts on uh, finite dimensional modules because the actions of the E's and the F, they like push weights up and push weights down. And therefore, like uh, after like finitely, finitely many steps, you get zeros from these exponentials. And the action of this part is also by some suitable power of Q, Q to the power of like a pairing of lambda and mu, where lambda and mu are 
so I say two weight spaces. So you can like you, this action, even though like it's like infinite series, it's well defined on tensor products of modules in this nice category of modules. So that's what this universal R matrix is, and it, it gives us this braiding. And one can see that it satisfies these fundamental relations. So the first one is basically saying that you get this isomorphism from V tensor W to W tensor V as UQGLN modules. And the second and the third relation basically say that the braiding satisfies the hexagon action. Now, any Hopf algebra which has this universal R matrix, uh, for any Hopf algebra which has such a universal R matrix satisfying these relations, one can do a construction which is known as the twisted tensor product of algebras, which I'm going to describe. It seems to be folklore, and I don't know to whom it can be attributed. I've seen this in various like uh, papers, like uh, not very new. So what is going on is the following. If you take A and B to be two H module algebras, then we can equip A tensor B with a new associative product coming from this R matrix. So the new associative product, which I denoted by bullet uh, on this slide and on this slide only, is given by the following formula. You take A tensor one, multiplied by the usual product of A tensor B with R check B tensor I prime. So you apply R to B tensor R A prime, and then uh, this will give you something in capital B tensor capital A, but then you just flip the coordinates, so you get something in A tensor B. And if R check means flip the coordinates after you do R. And then you multiply on the right by one tensor B prime, again, in the usual multiplication of uh, A tensor B. So this uh, new operation, it turns out to be associative, and therefore it equips A tensor B with a new product which is uh, which I would like to uh, denote by this A tensor B sub R check. So this is like a like an A tensor B equals to the new product. Now, in the case of the quantized enveloping algebra, one has to be a bit careful because this R matrix is really not an element of A tensor H, and there's a problem like it's like a power series. But one can get around these issues. There are some technicalities that one can you know sort of wade through and get around. It. Now back to the two algebras P M Y N and D M by N. We would like to do a uh, a sort of twisted tensor product of this P and this D with respect to the universal R matrix of UQGLM tensor UQGLN. So this tensor product also has a universal R matrix. So it's the tensor product of the previous R matrices work. And these two algebras, one knows that there are these multiplicity free decompositions, which are analogs of the like polynomial space decompositions from classical invariancy. So this PMN is a direct sum of modules for UQGLM tensor UQGLN indexed by partitions of length at most minimum of MNN, and same for DMN, let's just get the, the contragredients of those modules. Now, if you do this construction, uh, this sort of twisted tensor product, you get this algebra, which is which resembles the Weyl algebra. I mean, it's like kind of looks like the Q version of the Weyl algebra with one problem, and that is that this algebra is graded. So it's like, you know, you just uh, have taken the sort of associated graded of the Weyl algebra although this is like more complicated than in the quantum case. So that's not exactly what we want. In this world, we really want some filtered algebra, which is not graded, because the usual while algebra is also filtered, but not graded. So you have to have something that lowers the degree somehow. So how do we fix this? So there are various ways to fix this. There's one way to sort of describe that there's a sort of a PBW deformation of this algebra and so on. And there's a more concrete way, which I'm going to explain it right here. So you can do the previous construction slightly differently. So you could say, okay, so you have this half algebra H, Oops, I have half algebra H with the universal R matrix um, R, and you have these uh, uh, modular algebras A and B. Now let's take some uh, H stable subspaces that generate A and B. So A and B are just portions of the tensor algebra by suitable ideals. And then one can show that this twisted tensor product is isomorphic to a certain quotient of the tensor algebra of EA plus EB modulo some ideal, which is given by the relations of a, 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 IA that describe A, IB that describe B, and some mixed relations, which are given by the R matrix like this. So these describe the relations between A and B. Now, having this, you can try to twist this by an invariant pairing between uh, EB and EA. So if you just repeat the same thing, but this time take uh, an invariant pairing with values in K, like psi, and invariant means in the Hopf algebraic sense, then you can 
consider this new quotient, which is the quotient of the tensor algebra of EA by EB modulo the ideal, which has the same relations as before, except that the mixed relations are just deformed by some psi VA. Then this new algebra is also an H module algebra, like the previous algebra, A tensor B over like R check. And this algebra is really the vial algebra we'd like to work with. This allows us to have this sort of Leibniz relation. You know, you have a non-trivial pairing. This gives you this sort of you know, mixed relations that lower the degree. And therefore, from this algebra PDMN upper GER, which I showed you earlier, we have obtained this algebra PDMN, which is what we'd like to work with. This PDMN is not a quantized, uh, a uh, version of the algebra of uh, polynomial coefficient differential operators. And I will be working with this algebra PDM and in the rest of the talk. Okay, so now let's take a look at the relations of this algebra. It's not that difficult to write the relations of this algebra. I mean, they look a bit scary at first, but they're really not that bad. There's some commutation and some more or less Q commutation plus terms with like, which are going up in somehow in the direction one of the indices is going up. These are the relations of this algebra between the partials and the P's. And in fact, this algebra was introduced uh, for related but different purposes, not exactly the same purposes, by Shkliarov, Sinatrikov, and Waxman, and later used by Olga Bestein to study Coppelio eigenvalue problem in the diagonal case for UCGLN. But the construction that was given for the uh, for this algebra was completely different. So what they do is they use uh, what's like, they basically like live in the world of bounded, quantum bounded symmetric spaces. So there's analytic techniques in defining the algebra and considering representations and so on. And I am not comfortable with analytic techniques that they do. So this is like an, an algebraic construction that we gave and uh, it sort of avoids all the sort of like, it avoids a big book on uh, quantum bounded symmetric spaces maybe in some sense. Okay, now here comes what you would like to do. So remember that we had this triangle that would commute and that was like, and then there was this mutual centralized there which would imply the first fundamental theorem. The question is, can we do this in the case of quantum algebra, a quantized enveloping algebra? So ideally one would like to have this, well, I mean, one has this map from this algebra UL from which uh, um, UL tensor UR into the endomorphisms of uh, polynomials on M by matrix. So from now on, I'll use this notation. UL will be the UQGLM acting by on the left, basically. UR is the UQGLN acting on the right on this space. And so these maps I have from uh, UL and UR into the endomorphism algebra of uh, PMN, I tensor them, I get this map from this UL tensor UR, which is ULR. And of course, the quantized polynomial coefficient differential operators act on this PMN. The question is, do we have a map from ULR into here? So that then the images become mutual centralized. Unfortunately, this is not true. The operators from UL and UR do not necessarily act by coefficient by differential operators, by polynomial coefficient differential operators. In fact, one can uh, prove a no-go theorem. One can show there is no way to uh, construct a Weyl algebra with some mild properties for which we have this embedding. The properties would be that this algebra is a locally finite module for this UL tensor UR, and the mapping, the action map of the algebra on polynomials is uh, UQ is, is ULR equivariant. If these two conditions are satisfied, then, you're, then the tri there is no triangle. You cannot have an embedding of ULR into PDM and tilde that makes a triangle commute. And the reason is that some elements of ULR actually do not act locally finitely, whereas the algebra of polynomial coefficient differential operators acts locally finitely for trivial reasons. So this uh, is a bit embarrassing, but in fact, things are not that bad. It's still one can prove some theorems. One can still prove a double centralizer theorem. So one can consider, well, maybe not all of UL maps into this uh, polynomial algebra, but at least a part of it does. So let's consider the image, the intersection of the image of UL with the uh, PDMN and the intersection of the image of UR with PDMN. So we have these two curly L and curly R as the images. And let's now uh, use these like uh, symbols LIJ and RIJ to denote the analogs of the polarization operators inside PDM cross N. Of course, we can consider such sum. The first theorem is that in fact, these two images, L and R, although they're not images of the full quantum group, still they are mutual centralizers. Oops, they're mutual centralizers inside 
PDM cross N. So each of them is the centralized of the other one. And then also, uh, each of them is generated by the corresponding polarization operators. LIJ is generated by these polarization operators. I'm sorry, L is generated by the LIJ and R, this uh, uh, other algebra, the image of the UR is generated by the polarization operators RIJ. So this is very similar to what happens in uh, classical invariant theory, even though we do not have uh, a map uh, from the whole quantum group into here. I should also say that the, the, like the parts that mapped into here, it's kind of related to the locally finite part of the quantum al uh, quantized enveloping algebra as defined and studied by Tony Joseph and uh, Gay Litz there. So we still do not have a full description of which part of this algebra lift, but it's clear that's very close from the results that we have. Okay, so now with the same setting, one can also prove an analog of the first fundamental theorem, which follows from the mutual centralizer by, by kind of uh, easy technique. So it, now it's similar to what Roger Howe observed. It's kind of repeated in the quantum world. So in this case, uh, uh, the analog of this space that we consider classically, which is the direct sum of k copies of a standard module and L copies of the dual of a standard, would be this algebra A K L N, which is generated by K N generators C I J and L N generators D I J. Uh, modular relations, which are essentially the same relations as P D M N. You could just, you know, the relations like uh, are verbatim. You know, they can be interpreted verbatim without any condition. And then one can see that the algebra of UQGLN invariants inside a KLN is generated by the polarization operators for I between one and K, so here one is missing. I between one and K and J between one and L. So now this LIJ, which is this operator, is really that quadratic. Of course, uh, you saw a quadratic, but here you see a differential operator, but that's just a notation thing. You could call this like a dual, you could call this like a TJI, TJR star, and then you would see like TIJ, TIR, TJR star, so it would be the quadratic similar to the quadratic that we considered earlier. So then, so basically we have this first fundamental theorem of invariant theory for the UQGLN. And now let me say a couple of words about the connection between another first fundamental theorem of GLN that was proved about 10 years ago by Lehrer, Zhang, and Zhang. So Lehrer and Zhang and Zhang prove a similar theorem like this one, theorem B, but for a different algebra, AKLN. Their algebra is generated again by KN DIJs and LN DIJs, but the relations that they have look like this. The relations that we have look like this. They're more complicated. But the downside of the algebra that's given here is that if K equals L, say equals M, they, you do not get an algebra which carries over, like which carries a UQGLM cross UQGLN action. In other words, their algebra, uh, it is not somehow amenable to proving a double committent theorem. So they have a while algebra, but you cannot prove a double commitment theorem because you don't even have an, a left action of UQGLM. It is not a module algebra with respect to the left action. It is with respect to the right action, but not the left action. So there is this asymmetry in the algebra that they define, whereas all relations are indeed symmetric. If you think about it, their relations, the second relation is only about like what happens to the uh, uh, the first index, the second index, you see the second index is if they're different, they commute, if they're not different, you have extra terms. But our relations are symmetric with respect to both the first and the second index. And we do have this sort of two actions, left and right. So this is sort of like a more symmetric picture. However, it turns out that the proofs become much harder for this algebra because one advantage of their relations up here was that you would have the LIJs or the products of the LIJs would be eigenfunctions for the action of UQGLM. Uh, UQGL, uh, I'm sorry, UQGL uh, uh, K, I think. Uh, am I right? Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. UQGL. Anyway, so they are eigenfunctions for the Carton subalgebra of a certain quantum group. The, the products of the LIJs here, they are not eigenfunctions anymore. That's because of the, the relation that says the indices uh, can go up. And even in the first index can go up. Here you see that the, 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 the first index is C and B, and here is B and C, and it's B and C. The first index is not touched. Whereas over there, the first index is touched uh, in, in our relation. So then the proofs become much harder. And that was actually the crux of the matter. So we, I first, like, so we first had an incorrect proof of the theorem B, and then it took us a month or so to fix the proof. So it became kind of more interesting. 
Anyway, so what's the strategy of the proof? And let me see how much I'm doing. Okay, I have uh, I have five minutes until my special guest arrives. So I'll try to pack everything in the next five minutes. Let's say let me say something about the ideas of the proof. So one idea, one important idea of the proof is something that's also used by Lera Zhang and Zhang, which is quite interesting, probably worth understanding and a bit better what's going on. So we have this uh, uh, sort of, the point is that we have a certain product on the space of polynomials, a new product uh, with the property that uh, you get a homomorphism of associative algebras from P and N equipped with this new product into P, D, and N GER with the property that the image of the map is onto the invariance. And in fact, this is a bijection. So this map is really not so difficult to describe. This map P goes from P and N to the Weyl algebra, the graded version of the Weyl algebra. First, you go by the co-product of P and N into P and N tensor P and N, and then you replace each Tij by Dji. You switch the order of the indices too. And this will give you some, you know, from any element in this tensor product, you get some differential operator here. And now, it turns out that there is this product here on this algebra p k by l, like for p n by n, and also you can reduce it to p k by l, um, depend, which depends on pairing with the R matrix and so on, such that the restriction of this map gamma n to the subalgebra p k l, which is the you know this like lower uh, right block of k by l matrices in the n by n generators, uh, so the restriction of the p this gamma n from P and N to this PK by L becomes a bijection onto the invariance inside PK, AKLN, this algebra I defined before, and it preserves the multiplication. So the product, the product of the differential operators here, the one with the twisted tensor product, uh, uh, is the same as the, pro the new product that we get by this R matrix. So of course, one can say, okay, we have this some linear map and we pull back the product. There is always some product on, on this uh, n by n matrices or like on k by l matrices, polynomials on k by l matrices, such that you have a homomorphism algebra. The main thing is that there's this explicit formula, and this explicit formula is important in understanding the properties of this product. Otherwise, it will be just some abstract product. You don't know what to do with it. So now back to the technique of the proof. Um, um, so the main point is, maybe I should say this here before I switch to the next slide. So the main thing is that now that you have this product, in order to prove that invariants uh, are generated by the, uh, L, the, by the polarization operators, you do something very standard. You say, okay, so the Tij's under this map gamma go to polarization operators. So products of Tij's go to products of polarization operators. Now, if you want, and then you can do some kind of de uh, degree reduction. So every different invariant differential operator, you, you, you show, well, it, this map is a bijection onto invariance, so it's in the image of some uh, product expression. All you need to do is that, in fact, the product is a surjection. So the product of this algebra is a surjection to be able to show that every element uh, can be written as product of the Tij's, the star product of the Tij's. And that is actually not uh, quite trivial. I mean, this is like a, 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 there's a couple pages of proof to this. It's combinatorial, but uh, it's just a proof that uh, I, I understand, but I cannot uh, sort of understand, I sort of explain conceptually. There's some kind of combinatorial proof here. Uh, anyway, so now another question which was raised is the, what is really the set of elements of UQ, uh, like ULR that map into the, uh, the, the, Q, uh, the quantized version of polynomial coefficient differential operators? And well, we don't have an answer to this, uh, like an exact answer to this yet. We have some conjecture, but at least we can explain which part of the Cartan subalgebra of the quantum group maps into PDM cross N. So let UL bar be uh, the elements of UL that map into PD and UR bar be the elements of UR that map into PD. Let's consider the images of these intersect. Uh, 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 let's consider the image of the Cartan subalgebra of UQGLM intersect PD and the image of the Cartan subalgebra of uh, uh, UQGLN intersect with PD. So this UL naught is just the Cartan subalgebra of UQGLM. UR naught is just the Cartan subalgebra of UQGLM. Defined as such, it's the subalgebra generated by K epsilon I and K epsilon I and P negative one. 
So now we cannot characterize this UL bar and UR bar, but we can characterize L naught, R naught, and these intersections. And the answer has to do with some Q determinants, interestingly. So let me explain what are the generators for uh, this algebra L naught. So L naught being the image of the Cartan subalgebra in, in PD, or R naught being the image of uh, Cartan subalgebra of the UR in PD. So you, you consider this uh, M by N matrix and uh, with like a, each entry is a star, but each star is a, a T or a D. In fact, I want the stars, all of them to be T's or all of them to be D's. I make this choice. So XT means I replace each star IJ by TIJ. XD means I replace each star IJ by DIJ. And now uh, I can consider sub matrices here, square R bar I sub matrices here, and compute their Q determinants. A well-known formula is pretty standard, this formula. So this Q determinant of XT is this formula. This L of sigma means the length of the partition sigma and so on. So now what we do is we, for each R between, R between zero and K, uh, and K between zero and N, we define this differential operator DKR, which is kind of a Capelli-like operator, not quite a Capelli operator, but close. And it's this summation, sigma determinant of xt times determinant of xd, where the summation is over all r bar r sub matrices of the last k columns in this matrix. Then you replace them either by all t's or all d's. By taking the last k rows, you can define another operator, which I call d prime kr. And now it turns out that the image of the Cartan subalgebra of ul is generated by a summation of these operators d i r prime, some summation of these operators that I see here with respect to the row construction. And the image of the Cartan subalgebra of u r is generated by some expressions involving the d i r. And well, the inverse images inside the Cartan subalgebra is easier to describe. They're just some Cartan elements with respect to, like, you know, uh, the uh, longest line elements applied to the fundamental weight or something like that. Uh, and in fact, the key idea is that you can compute the image of these explicitly inside uh, the while algebra. Um, okay, so since I'm running out of time, so this basically finishes what I wanted to say about paper, the, like the first paper. And then, uh, of course, all of this was done as an offshoot of the main project, which was constructing Capelli operators on inside X. Q while algebra and computing the eigenvalues of these Papelli operators and proving that these eigenvalues are Siddhartha's interpolation McDonald polynomials, which Siddhartha, I think, defined in the late 90s. So I will just uh, skip this part of the talk since I'm running out of time and uh, I will have a special guest, but I'm happy to continue the discussion at this point. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, I will stop the recording so people can ask a question, right? Yes, thank you.